moment now to introduce my dear friend Erling Kage, because from the very moment when actually Christina, Daniel Beecher, Philip, and I started to brainstorm on the theme of silence, uh, we've been very, very inspired by Erling's book, Silence in the Age of Noise. For those of you who haven't read it, it's really a very urgent book related to this, uh, to the theme. And uh, of course, to introduce Erling is almost an impossibility because there are so many dimensions to Erling. I met Erling first uh, when I wrote a preface for his book about his extraordinary collection. Uh, Erling has built up an amazing experimental art collection where very often he collects artists at the very beginning of their trajectory, you know, which is so important also as an encouragement, beginnings matter. Um, we then met soon after that, I had visited uh, an explorer called Arne Nes, founder of Deep Ecology, who was almost 100 years old in Norway, and uh, I found out that uh, Erling was not only a world-leading explorer, um, but of course also a great pioneer in ecology. He has uh, accomplished amazing explorations, the first person in history to have actually reached the, the three poles, the North, the South Pole, and the summit of Everest. And of course, there is this legendary 50 days solo in Antarctica with a broken radio, which had all to do with silence, you know, 50, um, 50 days of silence. But we're going to hear about that, about that soon, soon more. I then, again, a few months later, met Erling and found out that there is Erling, the amazing publisher. Um, the amazing publisher who translates extraordinary book into Norwegian, one of the great publishers of Norway. Then some time passed and I met Erling in an amazing situation of, uh, of silence where we together uh, on his initiative explored, uh, and it was for the first time for me in my life to do that, we explored hypnosis. And I found out that he's also a great expert in hypnosis. And of course, all of that enters his book. So it's almost like in superstring theory, really, with Erling, because there are so many, many dimensions in, in his practice. Today, Erling is going to tell us about uh, silence. And it's interesting about silence. Many years ago, I visited the uh, philosopher Gadamer, the German philosopher. He was almost 100 years old. And so he was alone in this very big house. And after about half an hour, we were already quite you know, far advanced in the interview, he all of a sudden fell asleep. And uh, I didn't really know what to do because he didn't want to wake up the great philosopher. So about 10 really long minutes of silence passed. And then luckily the telephone rang. I mean, you know, he, he had a, it was a time of landline, so, so he had a landline. And uh, the telephone would ring and he would of course wake up and he immediately realized um, what had happened. He said, I'm in an interview. Uh, he hung up the phone. And he looked at me, and he looked at the camera, and he said he will have greatest difficulties uh, to transcribe my silence. <laughs> and that obviously is a conundrum we're going to face with these two days for the transcript. And you will see later why this matters in relation to Erling's speech, because there is going to be a speech, and there's going to be maybe also something else, and then there's going to be in conversation. Erling is going to talk about why make life more difficult. And please give a very warm welcome to Erling Kage. Thank you, thank you, Hans Ulrich. Um, the title today is uh, Why Make Life More Difficult uh, Than Necessary. And um, the idea came to me because I have uh, three daughters and uh, they filled up with this idea about making life as easy as uh, possible or as pleasant or as happy as possible. However, um, I'm a strong believer in making life more difficult than it has to be. Obviously, it's related to me being a Norwegian. If I had been born in Sudan, it would have been very different. So, as Hans Ulrich mentioned, for instance, some years ago, I decided to walk alone to the South Pole, um, partly in search of silence. And um, I walked when you start out walking in Antarctica into this huge white nothingness, you feel that everything is flat, everything is white, all the way out to the horizon. 
as Hans Ulrich said, I didn't have a radio, so I didn't have any possibility to talk to the outside world, and nobody had done it before, uh, walk along. Um, so I didn't know for how long time it was going to last. Um, but what was interesting was as the, as the day passed by, I start to see it was not totally white after all. You saw these small colors appearing, bluish, reddish, yellowish, kind of growing on me, and it wasn't flat either. You kind of start to see all these details, all the structures in the ice and the snow. And in that sense, slowly, you will have the same experience in the mountains here uh, in Gantin too. You start to feel that your body doesn't stop by your fingertips, doesn't stop by your skin, but kind of extended into the environment. And you start to communicate with the environment like nature, you're sending some ideas out and you get all the thoughts back again. And, um, um, and you start to live very much in the present, in the sense that uh, the future doesn't matter, and the past doesn't matter because the problem with thinking, if, if you think, you think about the future or the past or future or the past. But the beauty of walking for a long distance is that you become one with yourself. And that again learned me a great lesson on, uh, on uh, silence and how silence can enrich our lives. And of course, in Antarctica, it was almost 100% silent, but I have spent half my life searching for silence um, around me, to find, uh, but I never found it. I, th I don't think silence as such actually exists, or maybe it does, but as soon as you get into that space, you will bring some noise with you. So silence in that sense is more like an idea, but my experience walking to the South Pole and also sailing across the oceans and um, climbing mountains and hiking a lot is that this, this inner silence which is the most important. And having three daughters, I started to see that they hardly knew what silence is. Um, and I think about silence, I don't think about silence as the opposite to sounds, but more like silence as the opposite to um, uh, distractions, uh, expectations, as uh, we talked yesterday, you know, all the people's opinions, and uh, car passing, a radio running, altogether so much noise uh, that it's easy to forget yourself. Because I think silence is very much about exploring yourself. Um, that's why we try to avoid it. While noise is very much about running away from yourself. It's noi uh, noise is about living through other people. It's about living through your devices. While in silence, you get to know yourself. And of course, that's difficult. And that's one reason we should make, I think, at least I've chosen to, to make my life more difficult than it has to be, because one of the meanings of life is of course to get to know yourself. And that's an advice that had lasted for thousands of years, and I think in general, advices that have lasted that long, we should take more seriously than advices that only lasted for a few weeks or a few years. So, um, yeah, I think that was uh, my introduction. Mm. <laughs> I can actually the silence now. Silence now? No, maybe a little bit, but it's uh, if you take the next photo, <laughs> just for fun, because um, uh, um, Arne Ness, the philosopher, was a great friend of Hans Ulrich and me. Is dead now, and I heard also he was a good friend of Rolf Singer, who's going to talk tomorrow, and he made this formula for feeling well, for well-being. And it's interesting because W, of course, is well-being, G is for glow, and P, B is for bodily pain, and P, uh, M is for mental pain. I think this is a good formula to keep in mind because 
life is very much about pain, life is very much about difficulties, and this whole idea about being happy every day and be as much happy as possible is almost like a scam. Life was never supposed to be uh, mostly about short-term happiness. And as it says here, Ness emphasized that G can be increased to water exponent you wish. That's again, of course, makes it into a very optimistic formula for well-being. We can take the next photo. Us because you showed us this image, you know, while tracking to the poles, and you said, of course, silence doesn't really completely exist. Uh, so I was kind of wondering what you did here while tracking. If you could describe that a little bit. Ooh. You know, um, I'm just going to actually let just read from my diary on the 22nd day walking southwards. At home, I only enjoy big bites. Down here, I am learning to value minuscule joys, the nuanced hues of snow, the wind abating, formations of clouds, of clouds, silence. And somehow, you kind of come into a kind of state and then you hardly hear anything. You can't just fill up with yourself. And Silence. You, and you also said that when you wrote the book, um, you told me at the time that it took a long time to write on silence because you wanted to use few words so to actually allow the book to breathe. And I thought it would be interesting to hear more about that. How does one write a book on silence and how can a book breathe? <laughs> I I, I, I want to write a book about silence because I felt I had something super important to say, but I didn't want people to spend more than one evening to read it. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then I, you know, then again, uh, inspired by my kids, uh, I just asked myself, what is silence? Where is it? And why is it important? And then I put down 33 answers. And I really m tried for every sentence to make it as short as possible. There's so many more things to write about about silence, but you know, I think you know, it's, um, yeah, I want to make it short and, and personal. And you also told me once that silence is not merely about the absence of, of sound, but it's actually about an ability. And I think that is so beautiful about the book that it almost teaches us this ability or makes us find this ability to kind of find wonder in the in the everyday. Can you tell us a little bit about how Yeah, I think that? I think you know wonder is the it's the kind of engine in life. And it's so easy because of course we're wandering as human beings. We're all born explorers and it's kind of but then of course then when we're one year old, two years old, we get corrupted by uh, parents, uh, friends, kindergarten, eventually school and we start to wonder less and less. And of course, as human beings, it was the possibility to walk on two legs who made it in us into Homo sapiens. And since then, two or 300,000 years ago, we have always been wondering, we have always been exploring the world in a physical way. We've always been moving. It's in our language. You move, you're being moved. Motion, emotion. But now we're kind of the first generation kind of start to move less and less and sit more and more. And we explore the world, not by physical means, but by looking into a screen. And an average kid today will spend around four hours every day on social media. And if they live until 84 years old, that will take 13 years, day and night of your life. And of course, that's why so many people today claim to be so busy and stressed and lonely and sad. Uh, because it's not, you know, it's not fully meaningless, but it's almost meaningless. Uh, one thing we also discussed, which I thought would be interesting here to discuss actually today, is you know the distraction, the age of distraction, and you talked about the fact that you actually felt more alone and lost whilst distracted by your iPhone or by your 
you know, computer at home than you feel walking 800 miles on, on location. So I thought it would be nice if you can explain that a little bit to us. And also I was very curious about that contrast, you know, how it feels after an expedition to kind of return home and suddenly reconnect, you know, how, if that's difficult. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, I think, I think it's most people that would have the same experience as me if you did the same things in the sense that when you're alone out in nature for the first maybe a couple of hours or maybe a couple of days, you feel this restlessness. You feel all this noise in the head uh, because you're thinking too much. And then you calm down and then you will not feel lonely. Uh, while I also spend lots of time venturing in cities and of course then you always remind, if you're lonely, you're always reminded about your loneliness because you see all these people, you see couples kissing and holding ar around each other, whatever they do, and you're reminded about you know, your loneliness. And uh, during lunch today we talked about you know, to bring a radio, satellite phone or not on an expedition. I prefer not to. Um, and then a friend of mine, he always has a satellite phone. He calls his wife uh, every day talk to her, hopefully she will say, every evening she will say, I love you, and he will say, I love you too. Uh, but then after four weeks, eventually she will say, the washing machine broke down today. <laughs> so. <laughs> Another quote from the book, you, you said, um, I often choose to do anything else than fill the science with myself. I have gradually come to realize that the source of many of my problems lies precisely in this struggle. And you then also quote the philosopher and boredom theorist, Blaise Pascal, which is nice because the book is also about history of silence. And of course, if you wanna uh, invent the future, it always happens with fragments from the past. And you, you go into Pascal and actually quote Blaise Pascal by saying all of humanity and all of humanity's problems stem from our inability to sit quietly in a room alone. Can you tell us a little bit about that, about this gradual realization that the problem lies in this struggle and to which extent Blaise Pascal was of help? Uh, I think it's very interesting that Pascal wrote this in the 1640s, late, late, late 1640s. And, and you know, he's, he said, you know, over inability to sit alone in a room doing nothing uh, is the origin of all of our problems. And of course today, in 2020, this has turned much more extreme. But what's important with Pascal then is that like, this is not a new problem. We have always had a hard time relating to silence. Um, but today, with a smartphone, etc., it has become, you know, um, almost like, yeah, it, um, yeah, much, 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 just much more difficult um, to find silence. And that, of course, leads us also to the question how to, maybe how to liberate time. Um, there's an article I found uh, from a few years ago which referenced uh, the ATUS, the American Time Use Survey, and which actually says that modern humans spend virtually no time on inward directed thought, and not solely because we are too busy. In another survey, 95% of adults say that they have found time for a leisure activity in the previous 24 hours, but 83% said they spend zero time just thinking. So I was wondering if you could maybe you know, comment on that and tell us a little bit about how to liberate time. Yeah, it's, uh, in, in my book on silence, I also have this research on goldfish compared to humans, how long your attention span you will have. And according to the research, uh, it's a uh, goldfish will have eight seconds you could focus on one thing, and a human will have six seconds. <laughs> so it's so it's uh, it's um, yeah. So it's it's it is um, um, today. I'm 57 years old, and and I go to 60th, 70th, 80th, or even 90th birthdays, and in Norway they always do many speeches. And every, t every birthday will be at least one, if not three or five speeches, which, which will be about life being short. Um, 
which again is a big mis misunderstanding because of course life is not short, but if you waste the one huge beauty opportunity to, you have to have a rich life, it will feel short. And this again, Seneca wrote about it uh, more than 2000 years ago, that life is long if you use it in a good way. Uh, while today, of course, if you do more or less the same things every day, and you not even in touch with nature, you kind of separate yourself from nature, and believe that you can only m relate to man-made environment, while Mother Earth is 4.5 billion years old, and you think it has nothing to teach you, um, then life will feel very short. But of course, that's your perception. But according to physics, it's very long. And also in relation to this inward directed thought, you know, which is evoked here, the idea that there is little time spent on inward directed thought, you of course also took me on a journey into the world of hypnosis. Um, and that was, you know, a strong experience for me of silence. Can you tell us a little bit why you find hypnosis so much more important for you than meditation and how we can connect hypnosis to, to silence? Um, one thing is, um, I think I have hypnotized myself throughout most of my life in the sense that if, when you go on expeditions, you hypnotize because you don't really care about anything else. What's to the left, what's to the right, what's behind you, you just want to get to that fixed geographical point. So that's one way to be hypnotized. And then a friend of mine said to me that, you know, if you're really going to understand yourself better, you have to go into hypnosis and, and explore what you have been doing with your mind. So then I learn how to hypnotize other people, but also learn how to hypnotize myself. And for me, that's just a great uh, voyage or discovery every day for 20 minutes. I just calm down and I go into my subconsciousness. And after 20 minutes, I wake up again. And it's dead simple um, uh, to do it, to learn it. And with Hans Ulrich, uh, um, Hans Ulrich has always been very, very kind to me. And one day I just felt that Hans Ulrich, with the life you're living, you should learn hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm doing it ever since, so I'm eternally grateful to you. Before, when you, you told us about the book, and it's always interesting, you know, how an epiphany happens, how um, someone has an idea to do something. And you mentioned that the epiphany for this book had to do with your daughters, had to do with your children. But there is an anecdote, um, and I heard different versions of this anecdote from different of your friends. So I wanted to ask you to tell us the anecdote, how it really was, because somehow, I think you were alone on Everest on one of your three you know, big expeditions. And after this, you sat together with your daughter and were in silence for once. There was something like that. Can uh, you tell us yeah. the real anecdote? But I, think, I think, you know, um, we have short time for questions, but I think we should leave one minute in silence between now and questions. It was Finn's idea, it was a good idea, because I think you will come up with the answers to most of the questions in that minute and whatever remains, you're free to ask. One minute. Okay, okay, any questions? Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Erling, very much for a wonderful presentation. I want to come back to the formula. Don't you think that it's quite dangerous formula because potentially it can justify any dictatorship with the glow of propaganda promises divided by pain? Uh, you know, if you believe to, I think every, anything can justify a dictatorship. If you, you know, if you, but I think in general, this is a very personal um, formula. I think it's, I think it's not a problem. You hypnotize? Do you program yourself with something when you hypnotize or is it just like a sleep? What exactly do you do when you fall? Not like a process? sleep, you more like you float. Do you send messages to yourself? Yeah, you can sometimes just follow an idea in the subconsciousness and just travel the idea with the sub in the subconsciousness, yes. Great, thank you. It's again not a question, it's a comment. <laughs> we had lunch together, so the questions had been asked already. Um, because you were in emphasizing the need to perceive yourself, to have introspection, <coughs> it's interesting that over the last decade or so, brain networks have been identified due to imaging technology in humans. And we have a lot of <coughs> networks, very complex systems that are inter interleaved with each other for sensation, for reactions, for programming, motor things, for the mind wandering, if, if you have, if you think about the future or digest the past. But there is a network which is called the default network. So the network that c comes on if nothing else comes on. And this network <coughs> is specialized for introspection, for bodily perceptions. And this is what contemplatives would identify with uh, the, the, the knowing of being one or being the self. And this network gets switched off immediately if there is something coming from outside that forces you to uh, develop a plan for an action. So what you're probably doing is when you don't need to control your motor system anymore after days and days of monotonous walking, is that you walk, you live with your default network. It's permanently on. And it's actually the network that gets activated in uh, people who do meditate and also in hypnosis. Thank you. Ben. Thank you very much for your for your talk and for your personal witness. Um, I, I just want to say uh, very passionately that I think that um, the disease of our civilization is a disease of noise. We don't teach our children silence. We teach them noise. We teach them to talk, to play, to make noise. We don't teach them the value of silence. We, have, we are creating this epidemic of external and internal noise in our civilization and our societies. Uh, it, I think it's reached such a stage where most people are walking organisms of continuous noise in their heads. I think the worst enemy of silence is the noise that we have inside our own heads. And it's been programmed into us from our earliest days um, of childhood. And I would like to uh, recommend uh, in schools that we teach silence. We need a new, we need a new program uh, that is different from this program of, of noise and of too much thinking. We also need to teach the value of listening to one's own being. There's no way in education, uh, and, and I've looked at education across the world, there's nowhere uh, where, where there's a, a focus on, on, this, on this stillness that is part of, of being human. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We have a question here in the second row. Well, thank you for, for the so inspiring uh, talk. Uh, as I understand, you're somewhat uh, a lighthouse figure, you know, reaching the three poles, uh, sort of a silent protest to the noise we just heard. And, and drawing from your expertise, my, my question would be for people that, you know, are not fit enough or don't have the time to <laughs> spend 50 days walking what are your, you know, your feeling on, on how to, you know, make a move into the direction of, of silence? I think it's, uh, I think my, um, uh, to find inner silence in general is super easy. Uh, in the sense that this inner silence is there all the time, waiting for you to explore it. 
So, uh, and with inner silence, you know, you can have it for a few seconds, so you could have it for a day or several days. And But, you know, when you get up in the morning, you can have some inner silence when you're still in bed. When you're having a shower, it's beautiful with some, you know, you find some inner silence. Maybe you walk a few stations all the way to office instead of driving. It certainly gives you some inner silence if you prefer to walk without holding anything in your hands, because, of course, as soon as you hold this phone in your hand, it's not silence anymore. And then again, in my office, I always walk the stairs, find some inner silence. And sometimes I'm stressed, and then I walk backwards up the stairs. And then I can only think about walking, and then again, I find inner silence. And of course, when you do, if you happen to do the dishes, nobody's going to disturb you, so then you will have inner silence. And when you have sex, you will have some inner silence, hopefully, and eventually go to bed. So, you know, it's there all the time. <laughs> Can we take one last question, very last question here? Or a comment? Um, sorry, it's just a response to your statement, Ben. Um, I disagree. Uh, I went to a Catholic boarding school and every day we had an hour of mass in which we were silent and we listened to readings and, um, so and sang, sang songs and then prayed and that is silence. You know, everybody has their own silence and the reason is simple because silence is about getting to know yourself, it's about your own personality. So your silence, Ben, is different from mine and hers. I mean, there could not be a better conclusion. Everybody has their own silence. Erling, thank you so much. Thank you very much.